Lizzie Borden has a name that lives in infamy. She's been testified against by generations of children in a nursery rhyme and is continually convicted in the court of public opinion. But is that fair? Did she swing the axe or didn't she? We'll witness the real flesh and blood murder trial in that hot summer of 1893. Next. The Borden case is undoubtedly without parallel in the criminal annals of America. It is perhaps the most puzzling murder which has occurred anywhere in the whole world. The perpetrator of this double murder was saved from the gallows by a most extraordinary chain of circumstances. Circumstances which perhaps would not recur in a thousand years. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Now number one in podcasting, thanks to loyal listeners like you. In this episode, our time machine travels back to the Gilded Age, where we'll search for the killers in the slayings of Andrew and Abby Borden. Acts of such savage brutality that one newspaper speculated Jack the Ripper might have hopped across the pond in search of fresh victims. Breaking down the case is first-time author Cara Robertson, who brings us The Trial of Lizzie Borden, a true story. Based on transcripts of the proceedings, newspaper accounts, unpublished recollections of citizens in Fall River, and plenty of primary sources, including recently unearthed letters by Lizzie herself, the book brings us inside a case that shook the deeply held convictions assumptions, and social anxieties of the 19th century's twilight. Cara Robertson began researching the Borden case as an undergraduate at Harvard, and she continued while earning an Oxford PhD and JD from Stanford Law School. She clerked at the Supreme Court of the United States and served as a legal advisor to the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia at The Hague. Her scholarship here has been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Humanities Center, of which she's a trustee. You can find her work in fine publications everywhere, and you can drop it on the book by visiting trialoflizzyborden.com. Okay, now that we've settled into the gallery to watch this Gaslight episode of Law & Order... Let's join Cara Robertson and witness the trial of Lizzie Borden. The Borden place in Fall River, Massachusetts, was a house of silences. A house of moody, brooding silences brought about by pent-up hatreds. Even from the outside, the Borden house, where it stood on South Main Street, had about it an air of ineffable doom. The atmosphere of a place accursed. I'm joined on the line by Cara Robertson, author of The Trial of Lizzie Borden, a true story. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, Dean. Well, it was my pleasure to read The Trial of Lizzie Borden. It's an era that's fascinated me for a long time. And your story is one that's also fascinating, how you come to write this book over a long period of time, and it's a transitional period in your life. You're accumulating credentials, you're studying for degrees, you're clerking for not one, but two Supreme Court justices of the United States. Even though your life is changing, you never seem to have lost interest, at least not entirely. I'm sure that there were times you went in ebbs and flows over researching the book and the trial How did you confront that task of digging into this? Because I can't imagine a greater challenge than writing a book on a whodunit, or maybe we'd call it a why she done it, that everybody has already formed an opinion about, that untold generations by now have formed opinions and decided whether or not she did it and what the story is. And yet 
you stuck to it. It stuck in your mind and you had to eventually get it to where it's sitting here in front of me. Very nice dust jacket. And there is all your work. There's 20 years, I guess, of your life right there. So how did you go about digging through over a century of myths, speculation, literal ghost stories to reveal this accurate story that you tell in the trial of Lizzie Borden? Well, I think the key for me was to go back to the primary sources and to stay as close to those as possible. Because as you say, there's so many myths that have grown up around the case and the murders are even immortalized in rhyme. So it was important to take a close look at the trial transcripts, the newspaper accounts, the witness statements, basically anything I could get a hold of that gave a contemporaneous view so I could put myself back in that time and place. And I like when you say primary sources, because not only is that always the important thing, but you said that because you didn't rush out and publish this book in a year or manage to get it all done in a year, put your life on hold for a year and do it, say, in 1990, which I believe is when you started this, you said new stuff has come to light. You've been able to have new materials, which it's incredible to me that that's possible after 120 years. I know it, it always amazed me. It, it did seem like things were just coming in at, at different moments and it was quite fortuitous. I mean, I can't say I, I intended to spend that long on it when I started out, but I, I'm glad I did because I think I have a richer story to tell as a result. John Lennon, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. <laughs> exactly. I, I appreciate it that you stuck with it because it would be easy to have this book, let's say, be 800, 1,000 pages. It would be very easy, especially given your expertise and background, to make it be dry legalese. Instead, it's a book that I think anybody could pick up, or at least it casts a very wide net for readers. You don't have to be a lawyer, certainly, to read it. You don't even have to be somebody who loves true crime or is interested in the Gilded Age. Before we get too far into the conversation... Give us the murder scene. Break down for us what we find and what happened on that infamous day. On the morning of August 4th, 1892, Andrew and Abby Borden were killed in their Fall River, Massachusetts house. Andrew Borden was discovered dead on the sitting room sofa, a victim of approximately 10 blows from a hatchet or another sharp implement. His second wife, Abby, was discovered upstairs in the guest room, face down, having suffered 19 blows with a hatchet. Oddly, the murders appeared to have happened about an hour and a half or two hours apart. The only two people known to be in the house at the time of the murders were Andrew Borden's younger daughter, Lizzie, and the Borden's housemaid, Bridget Sullivan. At the time of Abby's murder, Bridget was outside washing windows. When Mr. Borden returned home early for a mid-morning nap around 10.30, he was greeted by his daughter Lizzie and the housemaid and discovered by his daughter Lizzie about a half an hour later dead on the sitting room sofa. And you helped us visualize all of that in the book very much with more than just laying it out in words. Now, I won't go so far as to say kids could read it because you pick up a look at the pictures, but I love a book with pictures. It's it's something I guess I've never lost from when I was a young reader and you'd want to still see books. Show me a picture. Give me some idea what the person looks like. Even this illustration on the cover, it gives you an idea of the era. It gives you an idea of how we would be seeing Lizzie present herself in court. And those pictures and flipping through those, the illustrations, they made me think again of your research. You you must have had thousands of items that you could have included to beef up the story and to give people an idea, a sense of place, to be able to see that house that they lived in, for example, with no hallways. It's one thing to say that they had no hallways in the house as far as going back and forth between each other's rooms, but to see it in that floor plan, anyone who's gone on Zillow or looked for a house, It explains it to us in a whole new way. So how did you pare those down to favorites? And do you have any in the book that you really were glad you were able to include between the pages? Yeah, my only regret is I don't have even more. (laughs) (laughs) Though the publisher was very generous with me. Because I think, as you say, the pictures really help bring you into the story. It's good to have pictures of all the main characters. And the house itself is almost a character. 
you need to see what it looked like. And I think that works better than, you know, a mere written description to get a sense of what it would have been like to live in that house. I also thought it was important to put what we might call the crime scene photos in, and they're pretty awful, but they remind us of the, of the true horror of the crimes and, and why uh, Lizzie Borden's contemporaries were so shocked by the murders. And then just on a lighter note, I, I liked the cartoon illustrations from the newspapers because they give you a sense of the action at the trial. And particularly, they show you how avidly the case was followed by people and the way in which the spectacle of the trial itself becomes part of the story so that the audience members are illustrated as well as the principal people in the legal proceedings. Yeah, I remember you say that one of the artists, sketch artists, I guess we think of them as today, would look for good looking people, specifically women in the audience and try to sketch them and try to give you an idea because there's no there's no people that are going to be coming there videotaping the trials, obviously. So you want to see all you can and they're covering it for such a long time. You mentioned in the trial of Lizzie Borden how there's so many wires coming out of one of the buildings that somebody says the whole county could hang their laundry on it if, if you hung them up from trees. So this is a case that's not just riveting to us in retrospect. It starts in 1893, or I guess the actual murder is 1892, and it continues. It has such legs, and that's something that amazes me, because usually you'd say, well, I dug back and I found this murder. It ebbs and flows. She seems, Lizzie Borden, her case, to keep a pretty even level of interest, yet you were able to find new information. You were able to take your training and dig into something that's a legal case and make it available to anybody. And I wonder, what do you enjoy to read? What was it that made you not produce a book that was just something that was legalese, but able to produce what's really, maybe you'd call it a nonfiction thriller. That's that's how I would describe it after reading it. Oh, well, thank you. I love nonfiction, you know, particularly. I like to read history books. But I, I think there's a pleasure to this kind of narrative nonfiction where you, you see the ways in which truth is really stranger than fiction. And it's it's grounded, you know, in some particular era. And you can access that time and place through a compelling story. And it's hard to think of, of a story that, as you say, has been hooking generations more than uh, this Lizzie Borden case. And that house, something occurred to me as I was describing the house there. You say that the triple locked Borden house, triple locked, okay, three three locks. You call it the most elaborately secured domicile in town. And that detail of not having hallways to get between the rooms, you'd have to go through each other's bedrooms and think here of two adult daughters, their stepmother that Lizzie in particular doesn't care much for, and their father walking through they would barricade those doors with furniture. So that adds another level of security if you're somebody living in the house and also another hurdle for somebody from the outside for the killer to overcome. So I thought that that house, you'd think today, if you had a place where there were two grisly murders, it might be knocked down right away. Never mind one from 1893. What is it about that house and this legend that preserve that house or help people to preserve it who didn't want to let it go so that a historian like you in the year 2020 or or beyond will be able to go there stand in that hallway stand where the couch was and see okay this is how things were laid out uh well it stayed it stayed in the family in the sense that you know not to to spoil the story and the Borden daughters Lizzie and Emma moved out shortly after the trial but they rented out the house and then it, it passed into other hands after their deaths. Uh, and then it just, you know, it was lived in by, by families until it was ultimately converted into a bed and breakfast. Fortunate for us, we don't have to go there and find a parking lot, for instance, with John Milburn's house, which is where William McKinley died. It just was damaged, also damaged in fire. There's so much that can go wrong. So it's something that her house is still there. You could still go and, and see it and even stay there the night, I guess, if you're if you're of that bent. Did you do that? I don't recall reading whether you 
stayed there. Uh, but... Oh, of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> you stayed there overnight. You tried yeah, the, the current owners have decided to lean into the paranormal aspects of the case. You know, so that's that's something that they emphasize. They have it furnished to resemble what it looked like at the time. I like that you call it a locked door mystery as written by Sophocles. So I assume you locked your door when you were there. <laughs> <laughs> tried to try to sit there and imagine what might have happened and how because we always talk about how a sense of place is so important in history and in writing history and so it would be harder to not be able to go there and stand i would think to draw your conclusions and to write the book it's just so valuable to be able to go there and if people read the trial of lizzie borden and they really get into it they can go and they can look for themselves and in a way, it's still very much a living case the way that you have written this book. For instance, you ask people to send you what they think, whether she did or didn't do it, guilty or not guilty, to trialoflizzyborden.com. So having the house there, you said it's almost a character in the book. It's almost our only witness, or I guess it is obviously our only living witness left. The house is still the setting of the murders. So I think that's great that you can go there, you can stay, and I'm sure it gave you insights into the murders and how it could have been carried out in alternate theories. Yeah, there's something about the case, I think, that turns everybody into a bit of an amateur sleuth. And being in the house redoubles that so that you find people to this day standing upstairs and then falling to see if that noise can be heard downstairs, <laughs> peeking over the landing at a particular point on the stairway to see if you could see a body in the guest room, which is where Abby Borden was murdered. And so in that sense, you do have a feeling of what it must have been like to live in in that kind of a house. I usually say that when somebody's brutally murdered, in this case, two somebodies, that I try to push that to the end so that we don't define the person exclusively on that gunshot, or in this case, the strikes with the axe. So I realized that I was doing that to Lizzie Borden. I was picturing her as basically having been born with a silver axe in her hand <laughs> and that she was forever th there wielding it while her father and stepmother, Andrew and Abby, there forever lying, as those pictures show, in the trial of Lizzie Borden. Her on the floor, as you just mentioned, at the top of the stairs, and him there on the couch, a little half off, having his nap forever interrupted in such a violent way, or even the skulls, which they produce at the trial. So step back with us and explain to us what their relationship was like before the death befell them. Sketch those relationships of the accused and the victims prior to that bloody day in 1892 when they're living in that house that you visited, that you slept in. Was it a happy home or an unhappy home? Well, on the surface, it look, probably would have looked pretty typical, uh, you know, a very unlikely setting for any kind of violence. But beneath the surface calm, it was a pretty unhappy house. It was actually the site of what you might call a Cold War between the elder generation and the daughters. Uh, just to back up, I should say that Andrew Borden lived with his wife, his second wife, Abby Borden, uh, and his adult unmarried daughters, Emma and Lizzie, in this house we've talked about in a fairly quiet, kind of a mixed residential commercial neighborhood near the downtown of Fall River. And the Bordens also employed an Irish immigrant named Bridget Sullivan as a housemaid. And Andrew Borden's brother-in-law, John Morse, was an occasional overnight visitor. And those are the five people who figure in the story. As I said, that beneath the surface calm, it was a house of festering tensions between the elder Bordens and the daughters. It's not really clear whether Lizzie and Emma always disliked their stepmother, but we know that about five years before the murders, Andrew gave his wife a house for Abby's sister and family to live in. And we know that Lizzie and Emma resented this and told their father that, you know, what he did for her, as in his wife, he ought to do for his own blood. And he gave them a house of comparable value, you know, so that they would have the rental income, but it didn't heal the breach. And thereafter, we know that Lizzie and her sister tried to avoid their parents as much as possible in that small house, preferring to eat separately and to entertain their own visitors in a guest room upstairs. You mentioned the maid, Bridget Sullivan, and it seemed a good time to 
bring up the role that new immigrants' citizenship all play a role as well as status and class. For instance, the sisters want to live up on the hill because where you live defines you in Fall River, how, what your social status was. And they felt their father, who descended from one of the founders of the town, should be able to give them the nice house up on the hill where that would meet their status. They wanted their address to match where they were in the world. They probably wanted to be able to get married or at least participate more in society. So then when we look at the maid, Bridget Sullivan, you said her name, and I thought that was so nice of you since I felt for her because one of the things that they do to poor Bridget Sullivan is deny her her, her individuality by calling <laughs> her Maggie, right? And I wanted to mention her. They call her Maggie because, oh, the other maids were named Maggie. We just call everyone by the same name because we can't be bothered to learn your name. Right. All Irish housemaids are called Maggie, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty telling. Yeah. And it was interesting to me that Abby, the stepmother, who usually is the, you know, features in, as the villain in fictionalizations of the case, is the only one who calls her by her proper name, that she takes the trouble. But everyone else in the family just calls her Maggie. And she mentioned that Lizzie in particular, but also her older sister, Emma, you know, appeared to be dissatisfied with their living conditions. Andrew Borden was notorious as a bit of a miser. And he chose to live on what you might call a narrow scale. And that that was in contrast to the way that other people in what she would imagine would be her own class lived in the more elite residential district of Fall River on the hill. And they would have preferred maybe that slightly grander kind of life, something that didn't particularly matter to their father. Maybe multiple maids they could all call Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed when you said uh, she went to the trouble. And it counted as effort to learn the woman's name, but it did. And that made me think of the wider community that she'd be part of. Here you have waves of Irish Catholics coming over, and they're looking at Bridget Sullivan, and they're saying, oh, they're going to try to pin it on her. And here they're giving this lady that's from the nice Protestant Massachusetts from this family that goes way back to the founding. They're saying, well, she couldn't possibly have done it. And that was a perspective that in the reading and watching things that I've done here and there throughout my life and interest in the case, I never thought of what their perspective would be like as newly arrived immigrants and how they would look at this family and people saying, well, who else was in the house and holding their breath a little bit. I mentioned William McKinley when he was shot in 1900. There was a black man who turned out to have spared him from a fatal shot, although he does ultimately die, Big Jim Parker. And in African-American communities around the country, they said they were holding their breath because, my gosh, if it had been this black man who shot the president of the United States, we know who they're going to come for next. We know where the where the anger is going to be vented. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the case there. He was actually a hero. This is the case with the Irish Catholics there. They're looking and they're, they, they have a completely different view than certainly we would as contemporaries, but also than the people who would be reading those other papers. They even had their own newspapers, right? Right. There is an Irish Catholic paper called the Fall River Daily Globe, and it was pretty hostile to Lizzie Borden and also was fairly clear that if the person with her kind of motive and opportunity had been a mill hand or the housemaid, then that person would have been arrested pretty quickly and without the kind of hand wringing that preceded Lizzie Borden's arrest. She certainly wouldn't have a former governor representing her because she could spend the money right away, right? Because she gets her father's money. So that's handy. She's able to spend all that on her defense. Right. She she puts her inheritance to good to good use very quickly. <laughs> her sister actually authorized it, but it was a large sum. She was already represented by the family lawyer who did criminal law as well. And he immediately realized that he needed reinforcement. So he hired a, a well-known Boston trial lawyer and then for good measure added the added the former governor of Massachusetts, George Robinson, who had a terrific folksy manner and is wonderful to read in a transcript because he really he really comes alive. 
I guess it was a good idea to say yes to her when she asked you to sign over your control of the money, <laughs> <laughs> considering that uh, her sister might have been a little afraid of her. They're so eccentric, as they say, and maybe that's an example there with the Irish Catholic immigrants. You know, if you're wealthy, you're allowed to be called eccentric. <laughs> right. If you're poor, you're just crazy or you're just yeah. weird, right? But they were such an eccentric family. Yeah, they have this superficial normality to them. You know, in other words, if you just describe them, as the two unmarried daughters, which wasn't that unusual in their circle, living at home with their father and stepmother and active in their church, doing good works. On the one hand, they seem to tick all the boxes of respectable upper middle class femininity. But, you know, if we look a little deeper, there is something there's something odd going on in the household. We know that Emma was a much more demure character, kind of more, you know, what probably approached that feminine model a little better than Lizzie, who was a very strong-willed person, which which is both, well, it, it cuts both ways, if you'll excuse the expression. Some people note this, this extraordinary self-possession she has and her sense of determination, and they think, well, this is just a sign of true American grit, you know, the sort of character that you'd expect from someone of her type and class. And other people think, well, there's something unnatural about it, that it's almost a masculine kind of nerve, that there's something unwomanly about her ability to hold herself together in these circumstances. And the observations from back then are so different from today's and yours, especially, for instance, the jury is all men. So so the perspective is completely different. There are women journalists there that are covering her and we do have so many voices. That's a fortunate thing. It was, I guess, fortunate for you, even though it was a, a mountain to dig through to find the sources. And then you start to get some new sources. Now, being a woman works for and against her. And when people look at her and they say, you don't fit in a box, and why won't you? And then we try to jam you in there. Or or if we can't, it just annoys us. So we say, well, just be gone with you. We want you to get away from us. And that's something, when you mentioned strong-willed, her estranged uncle, Hiram Harrington, says she is very strong-willed and will fight for what she considers her rights. And I underlined considers there and also strong-willed because <laughs> that was a thing that they said about women back then and they did not mean it as a compliment. And when they say what she considers her rights, I don't think anyone would want to be told, oh, you consider that, you're right. It's kind of a the rhetorical pat on the head there. And his phrasing told me a lot about the attitudes towards women at the time yet another angle to look at her family dynamic because here's an uncle but he's estranged from her gilded age morals and fall river and the impact that they have on the trial of lizzie borden we could have been talking all this time about a trial in the recent past yet it's 1893 so give us a flavor how did that moral impact how did the view of women inform people at the time as you point out, it's just so striking that people look at the same evidence and then they come to diametrically opposed interpretations of it. And that may be true today, but it was certainly true at the time. And so the Irish Catholic paper, the Fall River Daily Globe, for example, calls Lizzie Borden the Sphinx of Coolness. And that's not a compliment, right? And it's a suggestion that there's just something off about her, that there's something unfeminine. And the idea, as Harrington says, that she will fight for what she considers to be her rights is an allusion to this idea that she might have had the sense that she was entitled to a better standard of living, which would itself be a sign of filial ingratitude, you know, really, really bad behavior towards a father who was taking care of her. But it was still, you know, technically within the bounds of feminine ambition, you know, the idea that you might want a nicer house. But the notion that she might actually want some kind of financial independence or the ability to live whatever life she chose, which is hinted at in that statement, is a step too far. And it's something that even the prosecution doesn't really want to suggest. They're really bound by the limits in both the defense and the prosecution of what they can say. And I imagine for you, with your legal background, you must have imagined yourself on one or the other or both at various times, the teams 
there were places that maybe you thought, oh, hey, they could have gone this way and they just completely avoided that because it would have been counterproductive. Right. I think those are the moments that are the most revealing because you see that they're limited, limited either by their own imagination of what was possible or perhaps just limited by the sense that a jury that, you know, that's supposed to represent the community just wouldn't believe that particular line of argument. And the play between those two things, I think, is pretty interesting in terms of getting at what the attitudes of the time would be. So you see that, and you alluded to this earlier, that, you know, basically the defense's job is to place Lizzie Borden as much in the model of typical feminine behavior as possible. You know, the more that they, the defense can make her seem like just someone who might be the wife or the daughter in particular of someone on the jury, then it becomes impossible to imagine that she could have done such a horrible thing. And by contrast, the prosecution's job is not simply to point out what we might think are the most important things, say the exclusive opportunity and her motive, but also the way in which she seemed to transgress against expectations of feminine behavior. That you know that the the transgression was as much a sign of guilt as other more conventional pieces of evidence. And you mentioned the jury and how they'd want people to look at her as she could maybe be their daughter, and that's something that they do in jury selection, right? They try to make sure all those men have daughters about Lizzie's age. Right. That's the that's definitely the defense goal, and the it seems like the prosecution is is interested in in having men who might imagine themselves kind of in the shoes of Mr. Borden, particularly men who have second wives. Yeah, because that, that's the case here, right? She's the stepmother, so that's not just something in Grimm's fairy tales. You have enough conflict with her father, but he does wear that ring. He's wearing it as death from her. So these are complex relationships. Yeah, the and the the fact that Abby Borden is Lizzie's stepmother is is key to the story. It is the piece that people can imagine being true and that it's very difficult to imagine a woman killing her father, particularly in that way. But uh, the idea that an adult daughter would have such hostile feelings towards a stepmother seems, seems more possible. It's also the case that there are many, you know, there are many families like that in Fall River and, you know, there aren't that many murders. So... <laughs> Maybe what I should say is that, you know, it fits a, a cultural trope, even though it's not borne out in actual numbers of deaths. Well, it's something you can get your mind around. And that's what I was alluding to before about the square pegs and the round holes is you could see, OK, she didn't like her stepmother. She really hated her stepmother. Or, oh, now in modern times, I know people look back and say, well, was there sexual abuse going on with the father? We have to figure out a way to get our head into the place where we can explain why somebody would do these things. And I think the fact that she's the stepmother and then explaining about the money, it makes sense to us. And yet, in fact, the money and the greed, I guess you'd call it, or the, the envy, the desire to live that better life, the prosecution doesn't touch upon that, I don't believe, at all. The idea that, oh, money is the motive. It seems like it would be the oldest motive in the world, and yet they don't use it. Yeah, it's a motive and a good motive. But it's not a woman's motive. That's the real issue. And so that, you know, hatred of a stepmother is something that, that you know, fits into 19th century conceptions of feminine jealousy or yeah. bad, bad female behavior. But murder for money is not, or let alone financial independence, is not something that, that um, seems plausible. Uh, I mean, you get it. You get it. What's so interesting about the case for me, which is that you know, in terms of the in terms of the many interpretations of it over time, you see the way in which all interpreters bring their present day concerns to that story and tend to look at the evidence through that particular lens so that every generation has a slightly different interpretation of the case based on whatever the preoccupations of the moment are. You're enjoying my conversation with Cara Robertson author of The Trial of Lizzie Borden, A True Story. You can dig into her story of the book and give your own opinions at trialoflizzieborden.com. 
Jane Kamensky, the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History at Harvard University, writes of the book, quote, The Trial of Lizzie Borden is a taut, understated masterpiece, the rare history book that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Kara, I think whenever a reviewer calls a book a masterpiece that I have to include it and quote <laughs> it, and I wouldn't if I didn't agree with it. I think it's amazing for so many reasons, not just the pictures, not just that you have an excellent subject, but it's concise. It's fast moving. It's not sensational. You didn't have to sensationalize it. We have two hatchet murdered bodies here. It's fine. You didn't stray into any of that paranormal stuff that you were talking about. The house, the Fall River house exploiting to try to make a buck. That's that's not what you're trying to sell this book as. It's even the cover, as I said, it's sensible. It's a nice illustration. It's not making you judge her. It would have been easy to have a bloody axe on the cover. And I know that at Simon & Schuster, I always admire the artists that they have that do cover art because they don't try to sell it with something that's over the top and they do give authors some input. I don't know if you had input on this cover, but it's not something where, okay, we're just going to try to capture your dime with something that's sensational. It's a story that made me want to pick it up because I said, Already it's Gilded Age. That interests me. The case is interesting. And it wasn't going to be something that was one of these in search ofs. If you've ever seen those, you probably remember them when you were younger. Leonard Nimoy hosted them. (laughs) You'd go in there and it's, oh, okay. Insert. He probably did Lizzie Borden. In fact, I'm pretty sure he did. It's in my head anyway. I could picture Spock wandering around in the basement there with the eerie music. And yet it's still spine tingling. And I love that because you didn't have to... You didn't have to gild the lily to get my spine tingling with the facts of this murder and the fascination with you digging into these documents. And there were new things that you found. And I wanted to mention those because that is so precious to you as an author. You're able to find new journals. You said the Yankees open up their attic and they bring out all of these letters and journals. And that's a great thing. But, of course, there's one source, one discovery that tantalized me because we can't get at it and those are files locked away in lizzie's defense attorney's office and i was talking with you before the interview and i said i was i was resisting the ideas in my head that if this was an episode of magnum pi or banachek or something like that i'd be (laughs) i'd be we'd be sneaking in there dress up as the cleaning staff or something sneak in there you know you could always on tv safes are so easy to open here's a locked lock safe, lock box mystery of its own. Explain to listeners why we may never learn what those files contain and why, therefore, they should pick up the trial of Lizzie Borden. I'll say it if you're not comfortable saying it so that they can get the story as laid out, as complete as is possible without these final files. Yeah, it's so frustrating, even as you're even as I'm listening to you describe the <laughs> it <is. laughs> describe it. Lizzie Borden's most famous defense lawyer was the former governor of Massachusetts. His name was George Robinson. George Robinson died unexpectedly in 1896, which is three years after the trial. The law firm that he founded still exists. And I presume because it was such a famous case, they just happened to preserve those files. There's no indication that they preserved files from his other work. But in any event, they have them. But their position is that they have this continuing duty of confidentiality to Robinson's former client, Lizzie Borden, and so that they cannot disclose them and they can't even really describe them. (laughs) What a pain. It's like, they can they kept them? You're saying that they kept them because they think they have this continuing obligation to keep them confidential. But you mentioned in the book they could have just burned them, which was very popular back then. But instead, I'm saying they, they're keeping them. It's become almost personal. You feel like right. just to stick it to us and wave the, wave the papers out in front of historians and say, well, we have a lot more here, but eh, you can't see it. It is very frustrating. Yeah, it's a slightly absurd outcome, yeah. I think. <laughs> I asked the you know managing partner at the time why he didn't just destroy them if his position, and, and this was based on direction from the – Massachusetts Board of Bar Overseers, the direction that they're not supposed to reveal them. He said that it would be abhorrent. He acknowledged the historical value of the documents, 
while at the same time believing that, you know, it's his duty to shield them from the public. Yeah. So <laughs> there they remain. Yeah. Okay. On the one hand, as a, you know, as a mystery lover, I, I do like that there is this unsolved mystery attached to the case that's out there. You know, in truth, I suspect that I have a pretty good idea of what's in the journals because I was able to get the trial journal and notebooks of another defense attorney. You know, it showed that they were very diligent about running down leads uh, in terms of possible other suspects and what he made of other witnesses and some other other things that, that happened in the case that give you a good sense of the strategy. And I also have the letters from the prosecution team in addition to what the main prosecutor called the multitude of crank communications from the members of the public, <laughs> advising the lawyers, you know, from the sidelines about what to do or where to look. So I, I think I got a pretty good complete picture, but of course it's terrible not to have this last stone that you can't unturn. Yeah, it, it's silly, really. But as you said, it's a lover of mysteries and it's also wanting a puzzle piece, wanting another if we have a peg out there, maybe this will be the one that makes her finally fit into one of these round holes and we can figure it out. But then you think about it logically and take a step back and you realize that there's not going to be a little footnote in the margin where he writes, oh, yeah, she did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we can we can be pretty confident, actually, that he he believed in her innocence. He interviewed her for a couple of hours in jail before he agreed to take the case. And when he agreed to take the case, he announced to his colleagues, well, of course she didn't do it, and saw himself as playing an almost paternal role. At least that's how he presented himself in court, kind of as a stand-in for her father, and that um, was effective as a strategy as well as being, you know, I imagine quite comforting. You'd think he would have to really believe in her because here the man's a former governor. He doesn't want to ruin his reputation by defending somebody who turns out to be guilty. There could be something out there. Anything can happen in a trial, even not even talking about just if he loses, which is bad enough for his perspective and his legacy. But there could be some evidence that could have come after he was on the case that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt she could have stood up in, in open court and declared, I did it, I did it. And so he must have really believed in it to, to be willing to represent her. Yeah, I think so. And it's also worth remembering, I mean, and, and again, in the, in the story, that these murders are separated by about an hour and a half. And Lizzie was seen by Bridget Sullivan and her father, who's the one who's murdered second, in between the murders. And no one notices any blood on her at any point. So for people who aren't inclined to believe that she could have done it, there are tangible reasons to support their disbelief. You mentioned fictional portrayals of her. I know Elizabeth Montgomery played her. I think Christina Ricci played her. And we've had things like In Search Of, and there's all of these documentary type things that are out there. There's endless novels that fictionalize the story. She even appeared in The Simpsons at one point, a version of Lizzie Borden did. Yeah, that's my favorite. She's the <laughs> poor woman of the jury of the damned. Yeah. <laughs> the most infamous, yeah. She has yeah. she has a speaking role. So that's from the beyond, she's able to strike a blow for a quality that didn't exist at the time. But in those portrayals, what do you find best? And I don't just mean physically. Who do you think is best, uh, the portrayal? Who was fairest and who took the most poetic license? Well, I, I like that uh, TV movie that Elizabeth Montgomery was in. And she plays her as a kind of a blank person. Uh, and there's a way in which we all, and certainly people at the time, project onto this figure of Lizzie Borden. And Lizzie Borden, it should be noted, seems to understand what's going on enough to dress the part. She dresses with care every day for court and arranges her hair and presents as this, you know, what they would have called a lady, because she's aware that that makes a difference to how she's seen by the jury. I kind of enjoy the blankness is what the what I would call it of of Montgomery's performance because it allows the viewer to decide for themselves until the very end. The one phrase you used in the trial of Lizzie Borden is she almost seems to employ a Yankee version of the rope dope and you describe her as infuriating for the prosecution. <laughs> People were fascinated by it and riveted by it and here they are still today. Yeah, I think that it provides a lot of fodder 
I mean, even if we separate out some of the things that made it so distressing for people in that era, the idea that a woman like Lizzie Borden, you know, a woman who ticks all the boxes of respectable femininity, the idea that that she could kill her father in such a horrible way. I mean, even if we remove the sense of gender difference that that shores up that view, I think that, you know, we still find it pretty upsetting to think that someone could do something like that and then present as essentially normal, you know, and functional throughout their trial. I mean, it's not as if she meets any era's definition of a mad person. Well, anybody that does something like that, you want them to have some sort of thing with them. I mean, I guess this is why we always go and whatever bias we have. I mentioned Big Jim Parker, for example. Hey, you want to, okay, if I already think this certain kind of person is prone to violence or the man before him, before the assassin that shoots President McKinley is uh, an Italian. He has a couple little Italian flags and he's babbling and going crazy. And the guards at the time really focus on him because at the time there are anarchists around and nobody notices this Everyone says he's a handsome, quiet-looking guy that's coming that, that is the ultimate assassin. That's a Polish-American, born in Michigan, and he just looks nice. He looks like, gosh, if your daughter brought this man home or you know, he was one of your son's friends or your son brought him home, you'd say, hey, the, the, what a nice kid. Lizzie Borden seems nice. She's in court. She's dressed up. She's 32 years old. Passion like that, a crime like that, you've lived 32 years of your life, you do it now? And it's also not an easy thing when you're swinging <laughs> it's like that so many, a bunch of times. It's not as many as the nursery rhyme, but there's just so many things that, that I imagine kept you up awake at night, especially when you were sleeping in that house in Fall River. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't say it was my best night of sleep. But uh... <laughs> What room would that have been that you stayed in? Uh, I stayed in Emma's room. Okay. I pretty much had the run of the place, but... I wanted to have a sense of what the, you know, the rooms felt like. And it did, it did seem, it, it seems on the one hand, you know, it's a quite, it's, it's certainly big enough house, but I think you definitely get the sense that, that no house is big enough if you're, if you're, um, you know, living with people that you have some kind of hatred for, or, you know, if resentments are building and there's no real possibility of escape. You know, one triggering event for the murders might have been Andrew Borden's decision to make a will. No will was found, but many think that he was getting around to it and that that might be, have been a will that, you know, either disfavored his daughters or in some way made them dependent upon their stepmother. And so one can imagine that that might, might have been the reason This is, of course, assuming Lizzie Borden is the killer. And uh, there's also the story that's not admitted into evidence, but about her going and trying to purchase poison, something that the defense really broke down, managed to keep that from being introduced into evidence. That's just one of the many fascinating things here in the trial of Lizzie Borden that I enjoyed. People know that she escaped. They don't know her guilt or innocence, but they know that she was declared not guilty, which is not the same thing as being declared innocent. Afterwards, it amazed me that she has the money to do whatever she wants. She could have sailed off to Europe. She could have changed her name to Mrs. L. She could have completely disappeared from the historical record. Certainly, she was used to staying at home. She could have made up any fictional backstory for herself she wished and disappeared, which would have made it even more frustrating now for you writing this book. But she didn't. She stays there in Fall River. So... Say we visited the town in the years after the murder, say it's 1900 and all of those journalists have gone home, but there's still occasionally people that are peeking around and saying, hey, which house is hers and did you know her and what do you think? What would the reaction be of the town? What would locals have to say about their most famous or, depending on your point of view, infamous resident? (laughs) I think that that's, in some respects, the most striking part about the case is that she she chose to stay in Fall River. Her acquittal was initially greeted with cheers, you know, both in the courtroom and beyond. But pretty soon people began to wonder, you know, if she didn't do it, then who did? And she was frozen out of the church that had formed the bedrock of her support during the trial. She found that the pews around her, her own seat were empty, and she got the message pretty quickly. 
she moved with her sister to a big house on the hill in the elite residential district, which was Ah. thought to be, (laughs) you know, one of the motivations for the murders. So on the one hand, she has what she wants, but at the same time, she's shunned. So I suppose you could say that's the tragedy of, of the story is that she ends up, she ends up living, you know, the life that she wanted, but it is a life that's fairly lonely. Uh, on the other hand, I, I should say that it doesn't seem like she had a lot of regrets about her life, that she she befriended the children of her domestic servants, and she seemed to have warm relationships with them, and, you know, generally enjoyed being a person of wealth and living in that area of Fall River. Did those children or the people that worked for her afterwards, did they leave any records you were able to tap, or did they just keep quiet? Well, they're they're very loyal, uh, which I think is striking. But there are pictures of her on picnics. Um, We know that she used to send the kids special delivery birthday cards, you know, so that they would get, they'd have the special postmark. And there were were often quite, you know, saccharine pictures of rabbits and (laughs) just... (laughs) And, it, you know, it's just a little incongruous to think of to think of those things coming from Lizzie Borden. But to them, she was just a sweet old lady who loved animals. <laughs> People, maybe not so much. <laughs> and she had, I guess, a lonely childhood. So it's nice that she, whether she did it or not, that she didn't resent children, which I guess she could have done for having a happier childhood than she did or happier parents. That was nice that she did that. But then you snap back and say, but if she did do it, then why am I feeling sympathy for you? Why am I complimenting you at all? Such a fascinating book. It's not, there's many great books that I've read and great authors that I've had on the show. And sometimes a book, you'll think of it now and then, but The Trial of Lizzie Borden, it just sticks with you every time you see it on the shelf. If this day I'm I'm having a little different view of it, or I think of something new, or find some new piece of information, it's great to have a book like that. It's great that you wrote such a book. Well, thank you. I I found it obviously riveting for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to work on it for so long. We have time for one final question, and it touches on that one that you ask readers to answer at the end of the book by visiting trialoflizzyborden.com. Do you hope or do you think your book has finally put to rest some of the questions of Lizzie Borden's guilt Or will this still be fascinating readers 125 years when your book is in its thousandth print? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I think the jury's still out. Even for those who think they know who done it, it remains a why done it. Well, Cara Robertson, author of The Trial of Lizzie Borden, thank you so much for taking a whack at solving one of the most vexing mysteries in American history one of the most vexing murder mysteries in American history. And I think I went the whole interview without a single axe pun. So <laughs> it's good that we can have fun with the story, but we do have two people. Right? It's hard to resist. <laughs> yeah. Kids are singing about it, right? So what hope do we have as adults? <laughs> I really wish you the best of luck with your Lizzie expose. I highly recommend it to listeners. Become a reader. Pick up the book. If you never thought a book about the Lizzie Borden case could be so fascinating, so interesting, and just so so much like a thriller, this is really the book for it. Not piled full of legal ease. It's 289 pages. So really a fast version of the story and heavily footnoted so you can look at some more of those things and if you do get a look at those files that are in her lawyer's office uh, give us a call let us <laughs> let us know what's in there because that that's one i'm going to take for a long time wondering just what might be in his notes well thank you very much well thank you i really enjoyed the book and the conversation i really appreciate it the jury have been out almost an hour it is 4 30 and they file to their places in the jury box Are the gentlemen of the jury agreed upon a verdict? We are, Your Honor. Lizzie Borden, stand up. Face the jury. Again, our book today is The Trial of Lizzie Borden, A True Story. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying books through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to Cara Robertson for joining us. 
and for transporting us back to Gilded Age America's most infamous murder trial. In a way nursery rhymes and sensationalized tabloid TV never could. If you'd like to sit on the jury of the Borden murder case, remember to visit trialoflizzyborden.com and give your opinion. You can also let us know what you think of the book, the murders, and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, Instagram at The History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. And there's our YouTube channel now, almost 200 interviews up and available for you to enjoy. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guy.